the defenders knew the Imperium would come. Very few planets had rebelled against the Imperium without facing the consequences. But very little actual reconnaissance had occurred on the part of the defenders. So where and when any invading force would actually strike, and most importantly, with what amount of force, remained completely uncertain. For Cardinal Zaphon, however, his defending forces weren't an altogether certainty either. Far different from the uniform, well-trained Imperial armies of Krieg, his forces consisted of a rather inconsistent mix of combatants. First off, there were the disciples of Zaphon. Many of these had been loyal followers of the Cardinal since the start of his crusade throughout the Scarus Sector. In the uprising on Vrux, they had proven their trustworthiness and dedication when they had delivered the planet right into Zaphon's hands. All of them had sworn oaths of service to the Cardinal himself, and in return had been granted the first pick of weapons and equipment among the stockpiles of Vrux. The leading elements among the disciples were chosen for their previous military experience, and thus these would make an elite fighting force supplied with the best weapons and training. But men of such caliber and unconditional loyalty were in limited supply, of course, and thus the bulk of the Vraxian army was made up of different types of troops. The second force of the defender's side were the Garrison Auxilia, the local planetary defense troops. Due to its strategic location and valuable stockpiles in the Skara sector, Vrax had always had a considerable garrison. Whilst they did not have the rigorous training and equipment of standard Imperial Guard troops, these could make an effective fighting force nonetheless. During the uprising, their loyalty was secured by removing any troublesome commanding officers and replacing those with hand-picked men who were easier to persuade into following the Cardinal's plan. The ample equipment looted from the stores of Vrax such as Lehman Russes and Chimeras would well increase the Auxilia's capable firepower. Surely, these troops could hold a bunker or a trench line well enough, but how well they would be able to operate such equipment in more advanced mobile warfare was uncertain. The next form of manpower was the Labor Corps. These had been indentured workers working for the Departmento Munitorum on Vrax. This made up an extremely large portion of the army. Most of them had been wretched souls slaving away repairing roads, constructing bunkers, transporting goods, and digging underground tunnels and warehouses. As a result, many had welcomed Zaphon as a liberator, freeing them from the hard labor inflicted upon them by the Departmento's demands. They had been easy to spur into rebellion against the oppressive Imperium, but once the planet had been taken over by Zaphon, they soon found themselves being put back to work once more. For these laborers, a way out was to join the militia. At this point, one in four either volunteered or was conscripted into this militia. Instead of working on logistical purposes, they would now be given basic military training and fill up the trenches of the defensive lines. Lacking experience and of dubious loyalty, these militia would generally not have access to heavy weapons but they would still make up the bulk of the forces, and with some additional training, would be able to effectively hold static defensive positions. Additionally, the Labor Corps was made up of a sizable amount of Ogrens. These simple brutes, while unable to operate anything more than the most basic weaponry, would still make frightening combatants if they were able to utilize their brute strength. Attached to the right squads and under the right command, they would potentially become valuable assets in the front lines. The most curious source of manpower in the Cardinal's army would be the large number of pilgrims that had followed Zaphon's crusade to Frax. Having no idea who, or even what, they were fighting, they had been easily convinced the invading force were heretical renegades coming to desecrate and destroy the holy shrine of Saint Leonis the Blind. So despite having no military experience whatsoever, these zealous men and women were willing to take up arms for the Cardinal and protect the Shrine World of Vrax against any invader. Despite their unwavering loyalty to the Cardinal, these pilgrims were considered low-rate troops and thus were joined in with the militia. A trump card within Zaphon's arsenal would be to release the men and women imprisoned deep in the underground dungeons of the Citadel. As some may know, the Imperium frequently locks up people with psychic abilities, awaiting for the notorious black ships of the Inquisition to arrive and transport them to Terra. Thus, in the dungeons, several hundreds of dangerously unprotected psychers are being kept, 
Perhaps the Cardinal wasn't aware of the dangers releasing such unstable people from the dungeons could entail, or perhaps he simply did not care. But surely one of his considerations was that amongst these convicts and pariahs, some potentially valuable military assets could still be conscripted to fight in the front lines. The final branch of Zaphon's army would be the Enforcers. Religious men and agents of the Ecclesiarchy who had followed Zaphon all the way from his departure from San Artorus, or were handpicked for their temperament and conviction that would perfectly suit this role. Taking on the role of a commissar, they had the authority to intermingle with the ranks, to preach the Cardinal's gospel and enforce discipline and loyalty. In an army of such varying quality, this group of enforcers was absolutely indispensable in keeping the army together. If anyone dared to ask an uncomfortable question, or Emperor forbid make any objections to the cause, they would be met with swift disciplinary judgment. The troops would be united under a single unifying purpose, defending Vrax and the Cardinal against any and all invaders at all cost. The terrain in the south and east of the citadel is crisscrossed with deep canyons creating an impossible barrier for any advancing ground army. This was not just mere coincidence. During its construction many hundreds of years ago, the building site for the citadel was carefully chosen as a strategic location. With this formidable natural barrier to the southeast, surely any attack had to take place on the western front, and thus this is where the most defense lines had been developed. Over the many years, three lines of defense, roughly 50 kilometers apart, had been constructed to hold back any enemy force. All eyes were now focused on the Van Meersland Wastes, where the first contact with the invading force was most anticipated. Already a year had passed since the 88th Krieg Siege Army had first set foot on Vrax, but the defenders on Vrax were still waiting for the Imperium to strike. It had taken the invaders a long time before they moved over the Saratama Plains and approached the outer defensive line. But finally, just on the edge of its effective range, blips of activity started appearing on the Vraxian radar. After many months of anticipation, the enemy had indeed arrived on the Western Front. When the signals visible on the radar rapidly increased, the defenders knew the battle was about to begin. The Death Corps of Krieg's campaign plan was relatively simple. It involved repeated offenses on multiple fronts. Rather than massing the entire army for a single point of attack, they would attempt to encircle Vrax and apply pressure along the line of defense in an attempt to stretch the defenders thin. From their starting position, the 1st and 30th Line Corps had moved north, with the intent of the 1st Line Corps to circumvent the western outer defensive line entirely. The latest Imperial intelligence from before the uprising on Vrax had suggested that part of the Northern Line had never been fully completed, leaving a gap on its far side that may yet be exploited. If that was indeed still the case, they could circumvent the outer defensive line completely and advance directly into the rear of the enemy's outer positions. From there, all parts of the army would be ordered to push through and advance on the second defensive line. This would drastically shorten the front lines, making the 88th Siege Army less vulnerable to counter-offensives from the Vraxian defenders. Thus, it was important that the outer defensive lines were overrun quickly and at all costs. Having encircled the second defensive line, the regimental command would then take a more cautious approach and take their time digging in. From here on out, they would methodically use the artillery to pound the enemy into submission and probe for any weakness in the enemy's lines where an easy breakthrough could be accomplished. Once the second line was cracked, this procedure would be repeated once more. This time, however, for the first time, the Citadel would come under range of long-range artillery fire. Once in this position, the 88th Siege Army could afford to sit and simply wait. Now there would be nowhere left to run from the merciless artillery guns of the Death Corps of Krieg. Surely at this point the enemy would recognize defeat. But before this inevitable victory was ensured, the army would still have to go through the motions to facilitate this plan. Coordination and communications was vital to these operations to ensure no part of the army became too far advanced and vulnerable to enemy counterattacks. 
And thus, while the first line corps made its way around the outer defensive lines, the other parts of the army opened up the artillery barrage to keep the enemy busy. Shells from heavy artillery like the Earthshaker and Medusa siege guns started raining down upon the traitors' front lines. At last, the great defenses on Vrax would be tested on a scale never witnessed before. Large craters were blasted into the surface of Vrax, huge amounts of rocks and dirt were blown into the air from the explosions, trenches and bunkers were steadily being pulverized, but the 88th Siege Army had a large task ahead of them, for there were many defenses to be destroyed. Meanwhile, the defenders didn't just quietly take the punishment. Behind the forward positions, their gunners were racing to respond with counter-battery fire. Basilisk artillery tanks moved forward into well-protected firing pits. Having observed the attacker's artillery barrage, they could now effectively pinpoint the location of the attacker's guns. The Vraxians opened fire, and they would rapidly score several direct hits against their enemy, destroying the Death Corps artillery equipment. The artillery duel was now well underway, and it became clear that this would not just be a one-sided affair. During these opening stages of the battle, the infantry of the 88th Siege Army had prepared themselves to advance. Under the deafening thunder of the artillery barrage and shells flying overhead from both sides, the infantry regiments of Creek started their steady march towards the enemy front lines. Orders were limited to a steady advance. They wouldn't attack just yet. The artillery would need more time to soften up the enemy positions. Instead, they were instructed to dig in as close to their trenches as was possible. Nearing the end of the first day, the infantry stopped a few hundred yards in front of the enemy. Covered by the artillery bombardment, they took out their shovels and started digging. In a short time, the first foxholes would be dug. Two men to a single foxhole, they'd reached six feet deep into the ground. Then they would dig out to the sides of the hole until it extended to the foxhole next to it. Soon the entire line was connected into a single basic trench that would make the foundation for the permanent frontline position. The weather on Vrax had always been volatile. The atmosphere's high sulfuric density results in regular thunderstorms with extremely heavy rainfall. These primitive trenches were easily flooded, and in these muddy swamps the infantry of the 88th Siege Army would become extremely dirty being covered in mud from head to toe. Despite these conditions, they continued their work. Fortunately, the pumice-like rock surface of Vrax broke down easily, and the trench line grew rapidly. Soon the trench became more advanced with irrigation systems and dugouts, providing the troops with shelter from the extreme elements. Communication trenches were dug back and extra lines were added. Soon the Death Corps of Krieg had a fully-fledged trench network close to the enemy lines, capable of holding the many men and equipment required for the assault. The 12th Line Corps was the first to receive orders to prepare for the attack. Artillery in the sector provided a deafening noise as the intensity of the barrage increased drastically in the last few minutes before the charge. Finally, the battle would begin in earnest when the 149th Regiment went over the top, ready to draw first blood in the enemy's trenches. On their flanks were the 143rd and the 150th regiments, who would provide a strong supporting attack to pin down enemy units. Behind them, the tanks of the 11th Assault Corps were brought up, ready to exploit any gap created by the infantry's advance. While the first waves made their way over the no man's land, the defenders rushed out of their underground protection and manned the defenses. Machine guns opened fire into the ranks of the attackers. They were cut down in swaths by the steadfast soldiers of the Death Corps kept advancing. Then the Vraxian artillery adjusted their aim and opened up a rain of fire upon the first wave. Clouds of smoke and dust thickened the air as explosions tore through the ranks. The second wave made their way up the ladders. Amongst them were many armored grenadier troops with heavy weapons. However, many would be cut down the moment they raised their bodies above the parapet of their trenches. But with a dedication that only the Death Corps can muster, the attack continued relentlessly and eventually some troops made it into the enemy trenches. With bayonets at the ready, they hurled themselves at the defenders. Fierce close-quarter combat ensued. Unfortunately, the effects were minimal. Even the third wave did not bring the desired breakthrough. The traitors had held the line. Encouraged by the heavy losses of their enemy, and convinced that this was the time for a counterattack, the Vraxians now hurled themselves out of their own trenches onto no man's land to assault the Imperial lines. The Krieg lines were still equipped with a variety of heavy weapons and inflicted heavy losses upon the advancing traders. But surprised by the enemy's daring ferocity, the Krieg first trench lines now found themselves overrun with the incredibly large mass of Vraxian infantry. A fierce melee combat broke out when the remaining Death Corps forces prepared to fight to the last man. 
The Vraxians, now emboldened by their early success, prepared themselves to continue their advance on the next trench lines. However, their plans were cut short when finally the artillery of the Death Corps opened up again and now pounded the trench they had previously held themselves, smashing the enemy's foothold in the Grieg lines. It had turned out the Vraxians were more capable defenders than anticipated. Not only that, they had successfully coordinated a counterattack that was only repelled because the Death Corps was willing to bombard its own trench lines into dust if the enemy made any ground at all. It was clear that neither side would be easily dislodged from their defensive position. With the hopes for early rapid gains now completely lost, both the Vraxians and the 88th Siege Army were digging in even more and preparing themselves for a long, drawn-out war of attrition.